Add critical language proficiency to your resume with language training at MEI. Through group classes or one-on-one -on -one instruction in Arabic, Persian, Hebrew, Turkish, and more will help you achieve fluency so that you and your resume stand apart from the crowd. Online and in-person classes begin March 27th. Visit mei.edu slash education for a list of classes and tutoring options, or call us at 202-770-0344. Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello to our listeners. My name is Lynn Snej, and I'm your host for this special podcast from the Middle East Institute Arts and Culture Center in Washington, D.C. We are proudly supporting the launch of an exciting new design concept and platform entitled Design East, focused on providing opportunities, exposure, and connections for emerging designers from the Middle East, Southeast Asia, India, Africa, and China, so they can thrive better in a global market. Design East is launching in Dubai on February 26, 2023, with a design pop-up show entitled Uncommon Threads during Al Sarkal Avenue's Art Week and coinciding with the major art fair Art Dubai. The pop-up exhibition will be up until March 5th at Al Sarkal in Dubai. For those of you who are not familiar with Al Sarkal, it is a forward-thinking arts and culture enterprise based in Dubai, dedicated to developing homegrown initiatives, cultural production, and events. The Middle East Institute Arts and Culture Center is delighted to be supporting this exciting initiative. We share many similar goals, and if you have not encountered our program yet, we were set up in 2019 as a space to showcase artists from the Middle East and to serve as a platform for dialogue and exchange around the arts in Washington, D.C. and beyond. We operate very much as part of the larger think tank, and um, we present many programs, exhibitions, and talks. You can find more info on our site, mei.edu. You can go to the Arts and Culture tab and you can find everything there. And now returning to our program today, I have the pleasure of hosting the founder and creative director of Design East, Ru Katari, and two of the amazing artists whose works will be presented in this inaugural exhibition at Al Sarkal. Rizlan Sahli from Morocco and Nur Hajj from Lebanon and the UK. I want to welcome you all to our podcast today. I'll introduce you briefly and weave those brief introductions into our conversation as we're going along. Welcome, everybody. Hi. 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 Hi, so happy to have you all here. Ru, I want to turn to you first and introduce you briefly so you can tell us all about Design East. Ru has built considerable influence in the design industry over 17 years living between the UAE and the UK. She helped Furniture Fair Downtown Design for six years, establishing it as the leading trade platform in the Middle East. She also launched Editions, a showcase for craft, handmade, and collectible design. She has been an instrumental mentor of emerging talent. Ru has launched Harper's Bazaar Interiors magazine as editor-in-chief, and she continues to advocate for sustainability and the circular economy. She supports craft initiatives globally and is an advisory board member of the Council for International Accreditation of Architecture and Design, working to support sustainability goals as an agent of the United Nations. Ru, it is such a pleasure to welcome you on our podcast today. Thank you for making the time. Well, thank you for inviting me. Ru, let's dive right into it. Tell us what is the inspiration behind Design East and why is it important now? Like you said, I've been working and living in the Middle East for close to two decades, working with designers who are just starting out in their careers Many in places where design or the creative industries are not considered as a viable option for young people. So being able to help nurture 
young talents, you know, inviting international designers into the Middle East to showcase and mentor. I mean, there is so much work to be done to help a nurture and grow the creative industries in the global south, but also to properly communicate and advocate for those creatives to the rest of the world. I felt so passionately that I wanted to give these creatives a voice and one that was not parochial, not colonial, but also really understood where a lot of this work was coming from in terms of environment and culture and tradition um, and helping to bring them to the fore, help them to tell their stories and connect them with potential buyers because, of course, you know, as much as we like to help these designers to develop their work, selling their work is crucial in order for them to be able to grow. So all of these kind of gave birth to an idea, Design East, which it's my baby. I've been nurturing for probably about five years. And when I started conversations with Al Cal Avenue, I realized that there was a way to do this. What we're trying to do, Lynn, is to build a virtual hub for the creative industry in the East. Much like, if you like, somewhere like Milan is a hub for design in the West in a traditional sense. We want to do that via um, a digital platform which will allow the various disparate communities to come together, to collaborate, to learn about what's going on in different countries, and to allow there to be a space for creative businesses from architecture to interior design to art to actually showcase how innovative, how sustainable, how creative, how groundbreaking and radical some of these businesses, ideas and projects are. But of course, we know that, you know, just having something online as, as fantastic as it is as a resource for everyone, it's much more exciting to have something in the real world that's visceral, that people can experience and engage with. And especially when it comes to art, nothing will translate the work any better than being able to, to stand in front of it and really feel the power of that work. Absolutely, absolutely. And I sort of was looking at the concept of Design East and what you're launching with and honing in for this sort of first pop-up uh, show, which is entitled Uncommon Thread. And you've chosen to concentrate this incredible energy, this, this showcase around textile. And as you sort of say, the oldest form of visual narrative. Of course, textile is so intimately tied to all our cultures and it's a tapestry of, of stories and possibilities, but also often rue associated with the past. So can you tell us why you have chosen textile to launch your platform with or perhaps the pop-up exhibition, not per se the platform, and how this is being reinvigorated through design? I'm, firstly, I'm obsessed with textiles and I always have been. I'm of Indian origin and textiles have so many meanings, the different sari fabrics that you wear, the colours, etc. All of these things have a much deeper meaning than you can see just from the surface without understanding the history, the tradition, the culture behind it. And of course, living in the Middle East for so long, working with countries like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, countries in the Middle East for whom textiles is not only a really important part of their industrial output, but also is very much part of their historical fabric and storytelling. I really feel like it's a, it's a medium that has been really underexposed. And I feel like there is a lot of innovation in the development of sustainable materials that is happening now because we recognize the impact that things like traditionally woven and produced cotton can have on the environment but also how much experimentation is going on behind the development of different textiles, you know, beyond what is obvious and what is two-dimensional. And what we're trying to explore with our show, Uncommon Threads, is how textiles are uniquely able to translate the nuances of culture, environment, and technique, and how they intersect with a number of different industries. So we will show pieces that express how textiles intersect with architecture, with art, with fashion, with interiors, with sound, 
and with tech. And some of our artists, I mean, they're incredible. They're weaving with all kinds of strange materials and found fibers and organic matter. And we even have the world's first digital loom, NFT. And so it's kind of a digital installation that helps us translate or transpose what is, as you say, a very traditional medium into the future. So it's about pushing the parameters, not only of what artists are doing and can do, but what people understand when they think of textiles. Fantastic. So before I sort of go to our fabulous artists who are with us, can you just very quickly give us a glimpse of how the exhibition will look like in very short sort of brief terms? How big is it? How many artists? What can visitors expect to see? Absolutely. Well, we have a beautiful, of course, it's Dubai, so we have a fancy warehouse. It's not that industrial. We have a 600 square meter space with a mezzanine. And on the main exhibition floor, we will have 17 different works. They range from individual pieces to installations by 17 different artists, all from different parts of the global south and beyond. Um, And there will be pieces that will be suspended from the ceiling, very big sculptural pieces. There are pieces that will grow out of the floor. There are topographically woven carpets. There are kind of organic forms that seem to kind of emerge from the walls. It's going to be something very unexpected. I didn't want the experience to be smooth and tonal. I want it to be jarring and vibrant and really an expression of that part of the world you know it's not beige it's full of vibrancy and color and crazy ideas and people pushing boundaries so once people have had an opportunity to explore that we have a little hidden majlis on the mezzanine floor where people can go and relax and view the the whole exhibition from above if they choose but we really hope that people come and don't see anything that they've necessarily seen before and certainly if they have it will be very out of context So I hope a lot of surprise and excitement and just a very positive reaction to it, I hope. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for describing so eloquently. I can sense the energy and the the vibrancy that the exhibition will uh, deliver. Ghislan, I want to turn to you and I will introduce you briefly and you and I can be in conversation about your work, your practice, and perhaps the, the piece that you have on exhibition. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Ghislan lives and works in Marrakech, Morocco. After architecture studies in Paris, Ghislan returned to Morocco and settled in Marrakech. She started her career working with embroidery and textiles, assisted by local artisans, and set up her own workshop. Soon after, her artistic career and designs using recycled materials and trash took off, and her practice focused entirely on her artistic creations. She formed the Zbail Manifesto Collective, which works with waste, and the collective appeared in the Marrakesh Biennial in 2014, presenting an installation entitled Pimp My Garbage. They were thereafter invited to participate in the inaugural exhibition of the Muhammad VI Museum in Rabat, and today Ghazlan continues her work with the help of local artisan women. Together, they seek new ways of working with silk thread. Ghazlan, I'm so happy we have you here with us. And I'm going to start by asking you about your relationship to textile and embroidery and how this story came about after a degree in architecture. Hi, Lynn. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here too. And I will do my best to answer your questions. So I have always been in passion with embroideries and textiles since I was a little girl. I used to draw clothes that my mom used to make for me. So after I studied architecture in Paris, when I came back to Morocco, I had three children and uh, one on its way. And I decided to create a studio of embroidery to make kids' clothing, but totally handmade. I wanted to have something that connected me more to my children. And I thought that uh, to start uh, working as an architect would take too much time for me 
and I wanted to spend time with my children and doing something that I really loved. So I opened that studio and it was a, an incredible experience for me because I never felt that I was at my right place. I wasn't connected with the fact of being a stylist, a clothing designer, but I really learned so much about, um, or what I know today, in fact, I learned it in that uh, studio, all the artisans that were working for me, and I was really in love with all the techniques they were using for the clothing, but uh, I didn't want it to be a stylist. And I knew that I wanted to do something with that silk, but well, for me, being an artist has always been uh, such a, a dream that I never even allowed myself to dream about it. And uh, I knew that all that silk, all that work I was um, practicing every day, I wanted to do something else, but not the clothing. And one day, a friend of mine asked me to be part of her magazine. It's um, a famous uh, art magazine in Morocco. And she invited some um, designer to create uh, some clothing with um, recycled material. And I chose to create a dress with, um, with waste that I really collected in, um, uh, in the poubelle, in the garbage. Garbage, yeah. Yes. And um, my dress has been chosen to be on the cover of the magazine. And I just loved so much creating that dress that I told to myself, that's enough. You have to really do what you have always wanted to do. And uh, by practicing th those techniques that you have learned during, I, I had that studio for like seven years in Marrakesh. So I decided to start uh, doing art with all those techniques. And I wrote some. Um, work that I wanted to create and um, I'm telling you all my story I don't know <laughs> if this is that is fantastic because I actually wanted you to make that link between your workshop and then the coming about of the Zbel collective the Zbel am I reading correctly that Zbel means also garbage in Arabic exactly yes Yes, it's very collective. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the collective is about and what is the larger mission. And then maybe you can tell us about the piece that you have in the exhibition. So this collective is not really, um, we don't really do that many things uh, today. It's been a long time we didn't do anything. But the collective was composed by my sister, uh, Katia Sahli, a friend at Manzin, and um, we were invited to the Biennale of Marrakesh because some artists couldn't make it. So <laughs> our friend that had the magazine to, uh, at the last moment told us, could you please do something for me here? Because I have that space that the Biennale gave to me and I have to do something and now it's too late. So we, those are often the best opportunities, yes. aren't they? So, uh, since we did that uh, work together, my, my dress for the magazine, and they were all part of the magazine. Etman was the photograph. My sister was the artistic uh, director. We decided to keep going in the same direction and to uh, work with uh, waste. So we created that collective's Bell Manifesto and we made a big installation that was a really, it had so much success. We were in the New York Times, we were in Arte, we were in China TV, in German TV. And for me, it was, wow, it was all what I have always dreamt about I mean while we were creating this installation it was so much love so much uh, incredible emotions and uh, so much creativity and it went so far so quickly that I said oh my god I, I'm exactly where I want to be but I think it's just uh, in French we say un feu de paille um, mm -hmm. it's just put out and it's going to be the end yeah. of it but yes. then a Swiss uh, creator that knew my work with the kids' clothing, Kay, uh, she saw the, the installation and she asked me to be part of an exhibition that she was, uh, she was organizing in Marrakesh and she wanted to invite contemporary 
artists and women of the Medina. And this was exactly what I was looking for. So I said, of course, I want to do it. So I did my first work as a solo artist. It was called the Metamorphose. And um, I wanted to work with silk, of course. And I was looking uh, for uh, something to cover with silk. But I wanted something very organic, very round, very something circular. So I spent the whole week looking in the Medina for something, an object, like a ball, like, um, and uh, I couldn't find. And uh, I was uh, at Darb Lerj where I had that first exhibition with all the women that I was supposed to work with. And uh, I was drinking some water (laughs) in a bottle and I said, oh my God, this is exactly what I need. I just worked with all that waste and it was such an incredible experience. So I decided to keep working with it and I took that bottle, I cut it and we cover it with silk. And that was the first alveoli, I call them alveoli, that I created for my work. And since that, I I mean, I've been invited to many places uh, to exhibit. And um, that is just a fantastic story. Uh, Rizlan, before I move to Noor, I would like to ask you to very quickly describe your piece in the exhibition that you have. Are they the silk alveolis or are you presenting another work? No, they are part of those silk alveolis. So I present two artworks that are part of a work that is called La Mer, Origine du Monde. La Mer, which is the sea in French, but also the mother. And Origine du Monde, it's... uh, Origin of the world, right? And my work is always connected. I mean, my subject of interest is the woman, woman's body and her uh, intimacy. So this artwork speaks about the connection between the sea and the mother and uh, the the woman that she is. And uh, the sea is our mother to all. Uh, I mean, we all come from there. And uh, so these are, yeah, the two artworks I'm presenting uh, there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love the connection to the environment and to Mother Earth. And I will come back to you and Rue as well. But I want to turn to Noor. And Noor, I welcome. And I'd like to loop you into our conversation as in stitch you in. Hi. And, and Noor, Noor Hajj is an award-winning British Lebanese artist and designer working across textile and digital. Her practice is centered on the exploration of West Asian identities, cultural history, and storytelling with a particular focus on the role of women, the supernatural, and mental well-being. She was the inaugural Jamil Fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 2021-2022 and was awarded the Bogossian Foundation Prize in 2014. She graduated from Parsons School of Design in Paris and has exhibited in London and New York City, and she is based between London and Dubai. Welcome, Noor. Hi, thank you for having me. And maybe you can introduce us in more detail to your work, both the physical designs and your digital designs. I don't know if you are the artist behind that digital loop, but we will soon find out as I ask you to describe a little bit more your work. But why don't you start by introducing us to your practice and to the vision, to the theme that drives your vision? Yes, of course. So I just want to start by saying I'm not the person behind the the digital loop. And I'm actually quite jealous that I didn't think about it. So (laughs) yes, I can't wait to see that piece. So I have a background in fashion design. So I studied fashion design at Parsons and I worked in the fashion industry for 10 plus years. So I worked with fashion designers in Paris And then I uh, moved back to Lebanon for a few years and launched my own brand and then moved that to London. So it was a menswear brand, basically. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I decided to pause fashion and just solely focus on my art practice while still working with textiles. And uh, basically, I had... The thing is, like, I realized throughout the last few years that 
I design collections much more like an artist than a designer. And I started kind of experimenting with textiles and maybe like exploring my art practice in 2019. And I was commissioned my first art piece and a group show. And that was in London. So on the back of that, I got approached by the V&A Museum and they offered me a nine-month uh, research fellowship. So they basically allowed me to come into the museum for nine months and research their textile and jewelry collection from West Asia. So in what they call the Middle East department, basically. And uh, yeah, and focus my research into a specific topic and create art pieces based out of it. And so during those nine months, I decided to focus my research on divine and supernatural protections against the evil eye and illnesses, specifically looking at the Levant area. So Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Palestine. And basically just looking at all sorts of things that we've used historically and even up to today to kind of like protect us. So whether that's in shapes or colors or fumigation or cultural practices, all these different things. And the more I kind of researched it, the more I kind of discovered these things and I've discovered a part of me that was always there. So I've always had, um, because I, I grew up between Riyadh and Beirut and uh, so I've always was immersed in these practices and I, it was just kind of like second nature. I never really thought about it. I never really looked at it. But during that time at the V&A, I really kind of, you know, looked at it in a more research type of way, more kind of these practices were done in these countries and were, and it's just kind of nice to kind of see it in that, in that aspect. And it just ignited something that was already in me. And yeah, from that research, I created, it's called the Talisman series. It's an ongoing body of work with textiles. And one of them, uh, actually two of them will be showing at the exhibition launching uh, at the end of the month in El Sarkar. And um, yeah, basically what I did with this series is that I've kind of picked up certain notions that really hit very close and I've developed them into textile pieces. Yeah. Can, can you describe some of those pieces that you have in the show? I mean, it's incredible how those, as you say, all of this is so much rooted in the cultural histories of, of the mm -hmm. region, right? And they, we all use them and we all refer to them, you know, those of us who come from this region and from those cultures. Yeah, so the the three pieces that I've created are big scale, medium to big scale pieces. So the, the reason why they're medium to big scale is that I tend to work with textiles in big scale because I want to reference the role of women in making textiles historically and that kind of like how difficult it is to create textiles. So it's like a physical work, basically. And so one of the pieces is called Running Around Mother Happy, and it's this big textile piece that hangs and it's made out of pinatex, which is, it's like a new form of textile a material that's made out of pineapple leaves. So it's supposed to be like an alternative to leather. So it's made out of pinatex and wool and it's all kind of, it's like a wide weave and braids as well. And this piece is all black and it's referencing this belief that the black color is supposed to protect children against the evil eye. So we see kind of these traditions in the Levant where people used to dress children in black or used, they used to put black kohal around their eyes as a way to deter the evil eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually the name of the piece running around Mother Happy is, is a translation from an Arabic lullaby that my parents used to sing to me when I was a child. It's like a small sentence from that. How lovely. Yes. And the second piece is, it's this big blue piece and it's hand dyed, I hand dyed it in indigo and it's, it has two sections. And it's a reference on the sun and the moon and how we've used the sun and the moon, not only as a way to kind of, 
live our daily lives and day-to-day lives, but also as form of protection. So the rays of the sun are supposed to give us this warmth and energetic feeling, whereas the, um, the calming colors, the silver calming colors of the moon are supposed to calm us down and bring us kind of like tranquility in our lives. That sounds fabulous. Thank you. Uh, I know you also have a, a, another side to your work, and perhaps we'll get to that digital side. You've been mentioned in the news a couple of months ago for your NFT work, and I hope that in the next iteration, I'll have a chance to ask you about that. But I want to turn to Rue and ask you, Rue, this is the first iteration of Design East, and how... How do you see this growing in future iterations? What do you hope it will achieve down the line? Our mission always has been to take design, designers, creatives, artists, work by architects to different places. So as we grow the community, as we develop insights, intelligence, and learning from all of this information that we get and all of these events that we do, We hope that Design East Digitally will become a really useful resource for the people working in those creative communities in the global south. But we have had interest from various different places, from Milan to Malaysia, from China to London, for Design East to pop up there. And the idea is that we don't cookie cutter, plonk our event down everywhere without thought but to be really considerate about how we evolve the physical iteration of Design East upon every event. For example, if we were to pop up in Malaysia, we would we would evolve the concept to ensure that we're focusing on craft, creatives and artists from that particular part of the world and helping to connect them to perhaps uh, collaborations with people on the other side of the world to create something that's maybe a hybrid to solve a problem to to really make the most of the skills that they have in in a you know in a more involved and integrated sense and i just hope we we grow and continue to be useful to people and enjoyable and an opportunity for people to educate themselves and become enlightened as to what people are doing um, in all corners of the earth in terms of their personal craft and I think just listening to Gisela and to Noor's stories, you can see that they're not straightforward evolutions. They're not, you know, they didn't start necessarily as artists, but it's how they evolved. And it's no, no real accident that almost all of the people that will exhibit in this edition are female. So it's also very much a celebration of female power in the creative industries, which makes me extremely happy. Yes, absolutely. This is an industry where uh, women have been sort of so successful and it has been a place really for women in, in that part of the world to express themselves and, and show, you know, this is incredible potential. But just, just I, I would also like to mention, Rue, that you are planning a series of conversations around the exhibition, right? And there is public engagement programming. Just briefly, do do the talks that are planned mirror or address some of the challenges that the design industry or designers in the global South face? I mean, just very briefly bef- before I turn again to Rizlan and Noor with a question. I mean, absolutely. The reason that we chose to explore textiles intersection with all these different industries is so that we can really delve deeply into how people from that specific discipline are working with textiles, the problems and challenges they encounter, and the learnings that they can share with others. And it's also a way of kind of bringing together everything that we have have learned as different industries and bringing those things together. So fashion, for example, they struggle in the Middle East, in Dubai specifically, in getting access to sustainable materials. So we'll explore uh, and try and find solutions and help connect people with suppliers that might work for them. So it will explore all of those things. Wonderful. I want to, a question perhaps for both designers, since we're talking about this bigger picture and the creative industries and the design sectors in that part of the world, can I turn to both our artists, Rizlan and Noor, and ask, 
you know, briefly, you know, Rizlan in Morocco and, and Noor in the places that you grew up with, you know, in, in, in excuse me, Saudi Arabia and Beirut and perhaps other countries that you visited or spent time with in that part of the world. How does the design sector look? Is it still very new? Are there educational degrees? In a sense, my question is, what are the support opportunities that exist for a young designer in Morocco or in Saudi or in Beirut, for a young designer who would like to embark on a design career? Maybe I can turn to Noor? Yeah, of course. So I can speak about Beirut quite easily because I think a lot of people know London and Paris and and the fashion world there. Beirut has so much talent and so much potential and but unfortunately, there is no proper structure for young designers to kind of go into it. When I say proper structure, I mean kind of like a big structure the way Paris or London has. But there are some initiatives that are absolutely amazing that haven't been able to find anywhere else. There's Creative Space Beirut, which is a free education school for fashion design specifically. I used to teach there when I, when I used to live in Beirut, and it, they tend to graduate some of the best students from Lebanon. And I don't know if they're still running, but a structure that's called Starch as well. So there is some sort of platforms. Unfortunately, Lebanon has gone through a lot in the past few years, so things are becoming a bit more difficult. Initiatives like the the one that Rue is starting, I think is absolutely crucial for places like that, because even if you're able to start something in Lebanon, it's very difficult to take it out outside of it, because it is kind of in a, in a bubble in a way. I don't know how to describe it more properly. Uh, it's very difficult to import and export from there or to even be connected to other people or other designers or other artists that are kind of in similar situations or kind of just not from the Western world. And that's why like, I really, really look up to what Rue is doing right now. And I think it's an amazing, amazing thing to be doing. Absolutely. Aslan, do you want to comment quickly? Uh, yes, uh, I just wanted to say that Morocco is, has always been a very rich country concerning textile. It's really part of our life for every event that we go through. There are not real structure to learn, I mean, uh, design and, and uh, textile, but it is transmitted, I mean, when an artist on is working, usually there is a young next to him learning. Apprentice, yes. But uh, unfortunately, this is um, less and less, of course, because the young are less and less interested on that kind of practice. They all want uh, something much more modern. But there are also some initiatives that are really interesting to keep uh, this... um, techniques and practice. Um, for example, uh, I have a very good friend, Fadela al Gadi, which is a very famous uh, stylist here in Morocco. She created a school and she invites uh, young people. She has some uh, contributors that uh, pay for the school and she teach them the ancestral embroideries and uh, um, way of, I mean, all our traditionals for the textile. And this is the rich part that we have in Morocco. I mean, and it is also really easy in Morocco when you have an idea to create it because you have so many artisans in so many different uh, domains, uh, poetry, textile. Uh, yeah, and the, and the wide array of crafts that yeah. are available. Yes, yes. You, you you can touch them directly and go to their place and find a way to create your own uh, ideas. Fantastic. That That is a testament to the importance of what a platform such as Design East can help bridge uh, those connections, uh, develop industries like this and scale up as well. Ru, unfortunately, our time is coming to an end, but any any last words? My only words are if you happen to be in Dubai at the end of February and you're visiting um, Art Dubai and Art Week in Al-Sakal, please do come in and see us. 
and discover something a little bit different about textiles. And some of our artists will be there too. I'd be really happy to to give personal tours to people that come. Absolutely. So as Rue mentioned, do not miss this exhibition. Put it in your calendar. Try to stop by and catch one of the many talks that are planned around it. And with that, um, I would like to thank my guests for joining this conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure to host you and to be part of this exciting new platform. For our listeners, follow us on social media, Twitter at MEI Arts Culture. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.